So go ahead and deal with this Shelly Young. I'm clear with where we're starting. Um, what about Bexy Mi'kma'ki? Mi'kma'ki um, is what people call is Atlantic Canada. That's where I'm from. And this is my community, Eskisoni. As you can see, most of our communities are, are right beside huge bodies of water. And the water to us, is, it's very sacred to us. We're deeply rooted to our water and our land. And when I say Mi'kma'ki, it includes Elze Buktuk. Elze Buktuk is in New Brunswick, and as you know, Elze Buktuk has been fighting for their water and their territory for almost a year now, a little over a year now. This is another picture of Eskasoni. So beautiful. Um, as Mi'kmaq people, our water is sacred to us as it embodies who we are. Our traditions are deeply rooted in the land in our water, and our communities live off the land and the water. It's our livelihood. We identify completely with the land, and we're deeply rooted to it. One thing, this is um, Ilze Buktuk. Um, Ilze Buktuk is in New Brunswick, and as you know, um, they were, Swin, a Texas-based company, began seismic testing in and around Ilze Buktuk. And the people there said, once they learned more about fracking, they pretty much, all of us kind of got together and we started to look up fracking. As soon as Island of Moore started, we were like, what's fracking? We didn't really know what it was. But we had, to, we had to learn quick and we had to become experts quick. Once we learned that it was gonna destroy everything around us. So once, Elzy Buktuk, once, they, once they realized they were doing that around Elzy Buktuk, they thought, who in their right mind would allow this? They thought, there's no way we're going to allow this. So they stood up and they said, no, there's no way. So they started to call for support. They started calling for support. And so we got in our cars and all of us went up to Elsie Booktuk to support. And this is some of the women. And it was, it was led by Indigenous women, as, mo as most of uh, Island were and all the Indigenous movements. And then what really set this apart, this is Nails Booked on Treaty Day, was that people, our people, when we come together, we drum, we sing, we laugh, we keep it peaceful. And that's what some people didn't get. I remember the RCMP, they used to be over there. There'd be, sometimes there'd only be 10 of us there. Sometimes it'd be a lot of people. But even when there was 10 of us, there would be like 20 RCMP vehicles like circling us. And we were really nice to them, I remember. We were always going over and, you know, ch chatting. We were wondering, why are you guys here? You know, we're not doing anything wrong. And they weren't allowing any, any media to come in. And I remember in the beginning, we were really happy for media. We were like, yeah, they're here, you know, they care. And they'd come and they would interview some, some people. And we'd, right after the interview, we'd look it up and we'd see it. And they were really spinning and skewing everything that was happening there. So we decided, you know what? We're going to start our own media. So we said, let's, let's, let's stop talking to them. We didn't trust them anymore because they were making us look really bad. And they'd say sometimes we were being violent out there or being aggressive. And we were laughing and singing and drumming. And there was a sacred fire there. We were used, doing ceremony. They were always peaceful. And one thing that was really amazing is that in, fracking affects everybody. It's not just a native thing. So what we did is we brought allies in. We started to reach out to our allies. It's so important, like Maya said, to reach out to your allies. So we became, we became a team, all of us working together. And we realized there were so many out there who cared about the cause. And so we brought them in. We started to meet up. And they stood with us, and right to the end. This is a sacred fire. Um, this is act actually not the sacred fire. They wouldn't take a picture of the sacred fire, but there's a sacred fire beside that, and there's always people circling each fire. And they would just sit around and say stories and try to uplift each other, because this standoff, it, it, was a, it lasted a long time. Right here, um, the RCMP, right away, I remember we started in May. In about June, they started arresting people, like 
unlawfully arresting people. Nobody was being violent because we were, the women and the elders were always telling us, no, you can't get violent, you have to be peaceful. No matter what they do, if they push you, don't push back. It was, we were, everybody was constantly told we have to keep it peaceful. Right here, Sigawat, he's from Burn Church. He's one of the kindest people I know. He's a young man, and he used to take care of the sacred fire. And somebody always has to take care of the sacred fire. Oh, I'm sorry. If you can't hear me, I keep turning. <laughs> and Sigawat was an was unlawfully arrested. He was never arrest, uh, resisted arrest, but they threw him to the ground, and they, they were very, very violent with him. And uh, this happened to many, many of our people. And people started to be afraid to go out there. This one lady, Sheila Joseph, she's from, um, this is actually on National Aboriginal Day. On National Aboriginal Day, People got together, we were happy, we were out there standing up for our land and our water. And Sheila's out there, and she's an elder, and she was punched by an RCMP. We're standing out there. And, and then her husband was also arrested for trying to help her. And on that day, I remember um, a pipe carrier was holding a pipe, and it's very sacred to us. And they arrested him, and they grabbed his pipe away from him. And they got away with it. Amy Sock, she's a lawyer and a mother. She was brutally assaulted by police um, at the October 17 raid. And uh, they didn't know who she was. They treated her badly. Uh, she's the principal's wife also on, in the community. She's a very awesome, peaceful, loving lady. And she was out there with her drum. And uh, while they were showing all these clips on TV for the world to see, what they were really showing was mainly a burning vehicle, all these burning vehicles trying to make us out to look really bad. There was so much going on there that you guys weren't seeing, you guys weren't getting, because they were only showing what corporations were telling them to air. And um, she was brutally assaulted and she was charged as well. On that day, on October 17, um, this is one picture you probably didn't see, but we used, this is on our, my page, I shared a photo of Doris, um, Doris Copage, she's an amazing woman, she's an elder from Elsie Bookdook, and she, uh, she cooks for everybody, she's just a loving, wonderful woman. And um, she was pepper sprayed here, and she had rosary beads on. And you see, there's two people, two police officers, RCMP, uh, spraying her, and she's not doing anything wrong. She's just out there. So we used this, and one thing that was amazing is when we, we decided we're gonna put this in our own hands and start to spread the message through social media and try to get the support we need, um, people shared. You see, there's a lot of shares there. There was a lot of people coming, and there was a lot of support, and people were starting to stand up from all around Canada and the US, and we were so happy because we felt so isolated and alone. And I listen to these women, and I talk to other people here. It's, it's very similar what we're all going through. So it's, it was just amazing. It was also very scary, the whole ordeal. One thing that we've, we've done a lot of different things um, through, through a little more. Um, but we, threw, we decided, you know what, we're, let's try to make this fun also. It's really hard. It's a really tough work. You, you deal with a lot of lateral violence when you're doing this kind of work as well, as the girls have mentioned. So it's really important to keep our spirits up and to try to organize things as well to get us together in unity and to have some fun. So we threw a concert. Um, we went to the UN. And uh, we also threw an Elsa Book I, I organized the Elsa Book Duke Benefit Concert. And uh, for all the warriors that were out there, the, a lot of our warriors are dealing with legal fees now. There's so many people who were arrested. So we decided to throw a benefit concert and within two weeks, we pulled it together. We had all these performers, it was amazing. And we were able to raise money for them, but there are still so many of them who need our help. And right now, they're in court. They're fighting and uh, it's, we don't know what to do. We're really, we're really stuck, we feel, because they're getting us with, with this law. Even though they, didn't, they weren't really doing anything wrong, they're out there. They're, they're basically fighting for their basic right to water, clean water. 
and they're calling them extremists and terrorists. And they're out there just trying to protect their water and defend their land. And we also had um, round dances, of course. And here, right here, one of the men here was one of the two, there was a few, a couple of men that were arrested and they were detained right up until a week ago. So they were in there for a long time, a couple of weeks. It's been about two weeks. Aaron Francis is a young man. Um, he's on my, I'm in the center right there. Um, he's on my right, I guess. And uh, he was arrested and he was in jail for a long time and he was just a youth trying to stand up for his people, trying to do the right thing. And he was in there and they didn't give him any rights to um, do his sacred medicines. He wasn't allowed to smudge. He wasn't allowed, they had to fight for everything, even making phone calls. And they were completely isolated. And one thing I have to mention is, the, is our missing and missing woman. We have 1,200 cases in Canada of missing and murdered women. Over 1,200 cases, and those are just reported cases. In, in Halifax, where I was living for a long time, Loretta Saunders, I don't know if you heard of Loretta Saunders, she was a Nook woman from uh, Halifax. She's actually not from Halifax, from Newfoundland. But she was studying in Halifax. Um, she was studying to do her MA, her master's in um, her thesis in indigenous missing and murdered women. And um, she was newly pregnant. And she was really passionate about this. She was going around house to house and really you know, studying. She was really working hard because she wanted to make change. She wanted to do what we're, the kind of work we're all here, we're doing. And she, she really wanted to get to the bottom of why these women were going missing and nobody was taking it seriously. And you know, how could we change this? And Loretta ironically went missing while she was pregnant. And um, the RCMP didn't even um, call the mother. They didn't, they weren't, they didn't care. It was reported and they kept saying, you know, they were so worried about her, it was really unlike her. And they weren't making any phone calls. They didn't, they didn't give, it was just another dead Indian to them. And Loretta, um, they ended up finding Loretta in a body bag off, right off the highway. Um, she was actually in a um, duffel bag. And uh, she was young. She was like, she had so much aspiration. She was a genius. I read her thesis and I was so amazed. Her and um, that's just one story. Imagine how many of our women go missing in Canada and in the U.S. and nobody does anything about it. The RCMP don't do anything about it. I remember reading a newspa newspaper article in Stephen Harper. They, there was an article saying, you know, there's these police officers who are, um, there's, a, there's a police officers who are um, attacking the women, he says, the, Indi the First Nations women. You know, what are you going to do about it? They asked him. He said, well, they're attacking them, and um, we're hearing that they're raping them. And they're, they're, Stephen Harper was getting challenged on that. And he said, why don't, if, why don't the um, native women go see the police officer and report it? <laughs> and it was like, you know, that's our prime minister, <laughs> Stephen Harper. And in New Brunswick, David Alward, he's the premier of New Brunswick, and ironically, the minister of Aboriginal Affairs, he consistently pushes the oil and gas industry in, in the Maritimes. And he says, I see these commercials go up every half an hour now because of election time, and it says, you know, shale gas, you know, it's the way, jobs, prosperity, you know, that's what they really push. They really push that on us, and we see it, you know when you see something over and over and over again, people are going to eventually start believing it. So often we're all, often question people who stand against the fracking and educate people about the fracking because we go school to school and we just try to educate everybody. We try to get allies and we try to get, being aware is so important, being educated about it. And then you see these um, commercials nonstop. They're always going, David Elward's on his, his gas and oil and gas industry agenda commercials and if you think about it, no money in the world is, just, is worth destroying our land and our water. I 
have a daughter as well. And as a mother, you think, you look at your, you look at your children, and I think um, with the whole movement, when, once I realized she has rights as a child to live in a clean, live in a clean environment, to do the things that we do in the woods. You know, we're able to, our people are able to go hunting and fishing. And I think about her, her basic rights to clean water. And I think I would do anything to protect her environment, anything. And I think the people in Elsie Bukduk, we know that Swin is coming back because they were just testing. And we know that they're coming back and we really need support globally. And I know we all need support, but I just, I pray that more of us can have the courage to stand up and speak out, even if it's uncomfortable. I know for myself, and I know the people of El Sebuktuk and my brothers and sisters all around here, and, the peop and specifically people in Mi'kma'ki. As I'm from there, is that we do not plan on stopping. It's difficult, it's hard work, it's uncomfortable, but we continue to push forward, and we, we don't plan on stopping and fighting until there is a ban in New Brunswick and right across Turtle Island because that's what we need. We're going we're gonna to survive is, is what we need. I wanted to talk about Annie here. Um, Annie is the lady in the white. She's wearing... Um, uh, She's wearing a white, she's drumming, and she's laying, she's a journalist. She was actually on the front lines in Elsie Bukduk. She's from Elsie Bukduk, and her son was the one who was arrested and detained right up until a few weeks ago. Well, Annie is also facing charges. She was a front line, on the front lines, and she worked really hard and to get the message out, and, and she just stood there. Like, she was just such a strong, strong woman. Sorry, I don't know what I did, just did. I need my tech support. <laughs> no, this is not mine. <laughs> it's okay. I think it totally X'd out. I think it's right. No, it's not on. Okay, so Annie, um, Annie right now is in court. She's fighting, uh, she's fighting this. She, one thing that is really important in, in us supporting her, we're always trying to raise funds for them, um, for, for those of us who didn't get arrested yet. We try not to get arrested. <laughs> and um, is that they continue, they're able to fight and get a lawyer and fight this because that's how they stop us with their constitution, their laws. So a lot of people are afraid to go back out. Once, they, once they're banned from the area, a lot of people are afraid to go back out there, especially if they can't afford a, a lawyer and anybody to fight for them. So we, we try to support them. So Annie right now is in court, um, and she's a, she's a student right now, so she's having a hard time. And um, we wanted to ask if, I think, I don't know if Clay was going to ask. Yeah, but we wanted to ask if you could help us with Annie in trying to raise some funds for her. I think that's their cue to get up there. Anyways, I want to thank you so much for listening to um, listening to our to my story and our struggles in Canada. I know that a lot of people think that uh, Canada, everybody's so nice and it's a utopia, and and that we're all not um, that it's. When I hear like you're Canadian, eh? Like they get so excited when they see us and they don't realize what we're going through. So 
I'm really glad that you guys are here to learn this real story of Canada and, uh, and what we go through on a daily basis, every day. Thank you. Well, I'll leave.